Welcome to the podcast series hosted by Help in Crisis 246, where we focus on teaching what you can do in moments of mental or emotional crisis and where you can find help. But the series is not limited to only teaching how to cope in moments of crisis, but we focus on teaching you everyday methods that anyone can use during moments of high stress, difficulties, hurt, mm. panic, anxiety. In other words, how to deal with some of life's most inevitably difficult moments. We do this through interviewing varying experts from different fields who share with us nuggets of wisdom on how we can cope in healthier ways through some of the most common difficulties we all face in life. We also interview those who are somewhere along on their own healing journeys and their journeys towards finding their authentic selves as they share from a very vulnerable and open position how they were able to navigate that journey. I'm Michelle Russell. I'm an attorney and a mental health advocate, and I'm very passionate about this area because I had my own healing journey that I've been on for quite some time. And I really just hope that the series can help you navigate your difficult moments and your journey towards a better version of yourself. So if this interests you, be sure to subscribe to our channel and you can follow us on IG or Facebook at Helping Crisis 246. And today I have with me Russell Mosley. He is a registered counseling psychologist in Barbados who spends a lot of time dealing with children. And for today's topic, we really want to look at how do I take care of the mental well-being and the emotional well-being of my child or children. And I felt that Russell would be the perfect person to have this conversation with. Hi, Russell. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Michelle. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> and you work a lot with children. Tell me about that. So I do work quite a bit with children. Um, I've actually branched out working a lot with adults as well. But um, yeah, so working with children is is always quite interesting. While they might not want to be to be coming to, to see a psychologist, quite often you'll find that halfway through sessions, they start getting very into it, very interested in what's going on. Um, some of the challenges are that they they kind of, you kind of sense that sometimes they might say what you what they think you want to hear um as i as some kind of aim to to impress maybe but um but you know it it's always uh at least i try to make it a little bit more of a lively interaction than than with than with um, parents but you know sometimes also it can be very heavy because it is sometimes quite difficult to hear some of the challenges that our our children face. Okay, so you said something interesting. Um, and I, I want to come to two things. Uh, people often think that as a child, nothing could be wrong with you. You don't have bills to pay. You what kind of stress could you possibly have about schoolwork? And we all went through that and we survived. You don't have any problems. But I'm going to come back to that. I wanted to start with something you said that sometimes in the session you get the impression the children try to say what they think you want to hear. And I believe that's a carryover because children can be protective of their parents or scared of their parents. So they can have the tendency to say what they think the parent wants them to hear when they're really not coping well at school, at home, or with any number of body changes from puberty. It don't matter how, as a parent, can I distinguish between when my child is telling me what they think I want to hear versus what is really going on? So a lot of that really is going to come down to questioning, right? Um, I think, you know, when you're when you're asking children, like, let's say, how was how was school? You know, you're in general, you will get good or or it was fine. What did you learn? I don't know. Um, and, and so you really have to be very I don't want to say slick, but you have to be kind of kind of clever at times with your questioning, because not all children are going to one want to share and two want to get into a long conversation, but they also might not want to say all of the the, the details that went on that were actually significant and are they significant to you? Because sometimes they might not think it's even significant, and and so really and truly, it's really a matter of you understanding your child or knowing your child. And then knowing also how to ask questions to get them to really open up and, and have a conversation with you. And then you can kind of start picking, 
picking out kind of interesting things, uh, things to kind of think about that they might not have thought was a big deal or anything significant. Asking the right questions, what does this look like? Because especially for teenagers, they're going to feel like you're prying. So what's the difference between getting into that level of inquiry that's necessary to gauge their true mental wellness and emotional wellness versus pushing them away because they feel like, mom, you're prying too much. Yeah. So again, with, with teenagers, it can be very difficult because they can be quite quite um, abrupt and quite um, distant, especially when it comes to relationships with parents. And this is part of the reason why I, I recommend for parents to get that ball rolling, to have conversations with them from very, very early, because starting when you're a teenager becomes very, very difficult. Again, having those interactions from early, I think, helps as you continue those interactions as opposed to just starting them when, when you start seeing things going going possibly not the direction you were hoping they would go. Um, and now in terms of asking the right questions, no, I can't necessarily say specifically, give you a specific question to ask. However, because again, that will come to you knowing your child and knowing how they answer their questions and what type of questions that they, they, they respond better to. But in general, you want to ask more open-ended questions, questions that they would um, have to explain more as opposed to asking a question like um, that, that would basically pr provide a yes or no answer. So you want answers that can, can basically promote discussion and promote questions um, or for further questions and, and further explanations. What I think can also happen and one thing you can also look out for is when you feel that they're ducking questions and avoiding questions avoiding certain questions then you kind of get really the 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 point that you're actually asking the right questions and you might have to be a little bit patient you might have to find other ways to ask the same question you might have to say okay well if this is the end goal of where i want to get with my questioning I might want to start somewhere else by asking something that is less threatening, less um, um, concerning. And you might want to direct the question maybe to a different topic first. Once you can can do that, um, then direct it to a different a different subject, and you kind of get them get the ball rolling, get the the mouth moving, and get the brain working. You can kind of start to angle those conversations towards what that angle was, where that maybe. Um, that that point that they were trying to avoid becomes a little bit more comfortable to talk about. What let's let's talk about comfort. I don't worry, I haven't forgot my first question yet. I go in there, but let's talk about comfort because you said um, it's best to create that whole conversational style with your child from their young. Don't wait till they're at the teenage level. But what happens when you did create that when they were younger, but as they were growing up for varying reasons, they get a little bit more distant. How do you find the balance between trying to keep that kind of emotional um, connection without pushing them further because they feel like you're crying? Because in my mind, safety is a big issue. And by safety, I mean emotional safety. And if a child or a teenager does not feel emotionally safe, and sometimes it's just perceived, you know, it's not actual. So yes, the parent might be emotionally safe, but the child doesn't perceive them as that. And it's why teenagers, and we all did it. We all went through it. You would talk to your friends. And you'll tell your friends all sorts of stuff. But sometimes you'll talk to an aunt. You'll talk to a teacher. You'll talk to your psychologist. And you will talk to your parent. So how does a parent create emotional safety for the child to be more willing to open up? So what I would say is that, you know, what, you don't want to, again, force that conversation if they don't feel safe, right? And so you might, it might be counterproductive to keep questioning, questioning, questioning. And so what I would say is like, again, learning your child and understanding your child is very, very important. Finding the things that they're interested interested in even the things that you might be interested in and having experiences together having shared experiences is that can go a really really long way to, to to building a bond without them even knowing that that something's happening right and so like um for I example, love that. i'll use tennis as i use tennis as an example because i i 
coach tennis as well and I play tennis. But um, there have been times when uh, a parent has come with a with a child and they've gone to tennis and they've played together. And you can see, you can see like the excitement of them sharing that moment with the, the family and it creates a bond. You don't have to speak about anything that is too deep. You don't have to speak about anything that might make them feel vulnerable. You're going and you're having a fun experience and a shared uh, um, experience with your, with your child, with your, with your parent. And that really can go a long way to the child opening up. They might even start opening up about, about the event that you did. So maybe the child likes video games. You go and you learn how to play this video game and you go and you start playing it with them. And then you can go and you ask them questions about the video game. I can't get past this part. How do you get past it so easy? And you go and you practice together and you bond, right? And then you have conversations about non-threatening things. And these things can then start to spread and spill over into, into things that are more serious. And if, if, and in, in, in that case, with a with a video game, that's actually I think really really powerful because I know kids really like their their video games these days. And when you come to them asking them questions about how they are so good at something, then it shows okay. Well, it's you know what it's okay to be a little bit vulnerable if you're not that good at something. And so then when they say, oh well, like dad or mom has experienced this before, maybe I can come and ask them about well, how do you manage to manage the household how do you manage to to deal with you know the challenges that you may have had at, at work or the challenges that you may have had at school when you were growing up and then again all of this just becomes this entwined bonding experience of of, of sharing now i say that and while I, i'm talking i realize that you know it's very easy to talk about it does it's not necessarily that easy in practice or that smooth or or um, in practice but again, it's an idea of something that you can try to do to to really get your foot in the door and, and get those conversations started. So if my child keeps saying no, to every activity, every bonding activity I try to come up with, let's cook, let's go to this fair, let's go for a drive, and everything is a no, what do I do? Do I give up? Or is it more about choosing activities the child likes and doing it with the child versus versus choosing activities for the child. So yeah, so again, if you if you come up with an activity and the child is not interested, um, then you know ask ask them to be a part of their life, a part of what is interesting to them. Because one of the main things that I hear from teenagers is my parent doesn't understand me. My parent doesn't understand. And then I ask, I say, would you want your parent to understand? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I wish my parent understood. And then, but then they, they kind of get defeated and they think, no, well, they will never understand. So then they're giving up. But if you're reaching out and saying, look, hey, I want to understand you. I want to be a part of your world. I want to understand your world, what you enjoy, what is fun for you. And I, and I see you doing this. It's like, I want to be a part of that. Instead of saying, oh, well, you're not studying um, because you always play in this game. I need to take away the game from you. It's like, well, you know what? Let me see what's so interesting about this game. Let me come and, and 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 play the game with you for a little bit, right? And then we say, "Wow, my, you might not even like it, but you say, okay, wow, man, this game is really interesting. Teach me about it. Teach me more about it.'" And again, just just a matter of again, no, they might not want to, but I would never tell a parent, "Okay, well, give up on it." But just you come at it from a different angle. Let let them lead a little bit. Um, if that doesn't work, then try a different angle. Try a different angle because a, a whole lot of this is 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 trial and error because you can't know what is going to work for every individual. You might cater it to what is a general thing that will work, but then again, everybody is it is their own unique person, and so then you have to say, okay, well, like, this general advice didn't work this way. Let me go for something a little bit more specific to this person, and then a little bit more specific again and again. But the point is that you don't give up. You just keep going. You keep trying, trying to be non, as as non judgmental as possible. Trying to to be non critical, and and just really trying to actually understand. Um, I wanted to to go into a part of this understanding, but I think it does relate more to your previous question. So before I preempt that, I will I'll wait for that. Because that's where I'm going next. People okay. believe children cannot have any real problems outside of perhaps, I think most people are willing to validate bullying as an actual problem. 
um, and maybe peer pressure, maybe failing school. And outside of that, they're like, oh, you get food, you have a house over your head, what you have to complain about? What are the, what are, I would say, some of the consistent or regular complaints you hear from children who come into your office? What are the challenges our young people have? So let me, before I even go into the question, I want to, I want to address a little bit of, of the, the statement that you made, uh, like, and I think that is also part of the problem. Like when parents are dismissive, they say, oh, well, you can't have any problems, right? Because that, what that garners is that is, oh, this person doesn't understand me. This person doesn't think that what I'm going through is, is significant. And so it immediately creates a disconnect. And from that disconnect, I mean, it's like, well, why do I share with you if, if you are either going to judge my problem and say it's not that big of a deal? It's like, so why why would I share? Right? I will I'll share with my friend who understands. I'll share with this person I go to school with that understands. And the problem with that then is that the person you're going to school with that you're sharing with might have a very poor way of coping. And if they have a poor way of coping, then they say, Oh, well, no, this works for me because I can cope for five minutes. Even though I feel worse after, they're like, okay, well, I'll cope along with you and we'll feel poor, we'll feel better for five minutes and then poorly after. Um, and so, again, I think that that whole idea, is, it, it comes from a, a thing that we do as humans where we try to humanize everything, but we also try to make things come from our own personal perspective, right? And when it comes from our personal perspective, you are disregarding the perspective of the person that you are trying to to reach out to right and when you disregard that person it's like you're you're trying to help someone to be somewhere but you're reaching let's say they're all the way east and you're reaching west because you think they should be west and yes. people, you're not going to reach them because that's not where they are Right. And so the idea is and why understanding is so important is because you have to really know and, and, and get and appreciate where the person is to be able to help them as opposed to saying, oh, well, you should be here. So when you're here, then I can help you. Then that I mean, it, it if we looked at it again from a physical perspective, it's like you reaching your your right hand when they're way over on the left it, it just doesn't make any sense and it's not going to be as productive as you might think it would be in your head and you know problems are age specific i would say the six-year-old who feels frustrated because they cannot fix a broken toy and we look at it and we say that's not a big deal for the six-year-old it's a huge deal and dismissing it teaches the child to shut down like i'm not going to tell my father this or my mother this because they're not going to think it's important but for them and they throw the tantrum and they cry and da, 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 it's understanding that at this age this is important versus yeah. what's important at 10 versus what's important at 15 when a child is having a, a panic and a breakdown because Brittany said something bad about me and you're thinking but so what Brittany's one out of five friends what's the big deal and the moment you start to make it sound like it's not big enough more often than not, is a failure to have empathy and to put yourself in the shoe of the child at the age-specific mental and emotional stage of what would be important at this age for this child. Right. Right. How, as parents, can we develop more empathy towards the child? Because the reality is this. When you have two and three children, right? One is generally easygoing and doesn't take on things. The other one creates a panic at every possible thing. And the third one is somewhere in between. How do you balance or juggle that kind of emotional support you have to give that's so different for all of them without being dismissive? Be more like your yeah. brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's that's one of, one of the more damaging statements that a parent can make. I mean, I, I even if... Even if they don't say that verbally, I can tell you a lot of siblings feel the, the, the message from that 
even if parents are trying not their best not to do that. And so when, when a parent actually says that, or when a person or even a teacher says that, like a teacher who has taught both siblings, he's like, oh my, but your brother was this. That is one of the most damaging things that an adult can do to a child. Now, as I said before, every person, every child is different. And the aim is to afford each child whether they seem like they want your time or not but to give them your time and to try to give them your understanding no whether they under seem to want your time or not really Cor so are you saying that Cor children can want to be around you even though they play dismissive and don't care they they absolutely can and and there are times when they they might not actually may literally not want you around but it's important that you are there anyway. And it's important that they know you are there anyway. And because I, the, the thing is that a lot of the time, some of this is, is stability, but also it is that saying, that, okay, well, look, I, I might, one, say that I don't want my parent around, but I really want to just see how committed they are to being around anyway. And then two, I might be like, look, I don't want to have this conversation with my parent or I don't want my parent to be around, but my parent is there anyway, not necessarily there in that up in their face and forcing, but saying that, okay, well, look, you know what? I understand that you might not want to have this conversation, but I am here for you regardless. And if you ever come to me and say you want to have the conversation, whatever I'm doing is going to be dropped. And I'm there because you know that I am your foundation. I am your stability, okay? And but, so, but what's the difference between doing that and spoiling the child? So that so, I am pretty much my child's lucky? So spoiling a child, and again, I, 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 there's one thing I would say is that spoiling a child for love is not the same as spoiling them for things. Spoiling them for, for your for your support is not spoiling them for for things and so for example no when we, we ask the, um children well when they're when they've grown up what they could have done differently or what they wish that their parents could have done differently and almost inevitably the answer is spend more time with the with the in, with the family and the reason being is that like if i okay so let's call let, let's say emotional spoiling. If I'm spoiling my child emotionally, it is me enabling them in their in in bad behavior. So they behave badly and they get in a conflict. And as far as I'm concerned, it's my child, so they're right. And so you spoil them in that, oh well, you could never be wrong. And I'm I support you no matter what. And yes, I'm gonna support you, but my support is not necessarily saying you're right, you're right, you're right. My support is telling you and teaching you what the right thing is. And so I can support you when you do the wrong thing by saying, nah, you did the wrong thing. And you need to learn what the right thing is. And I will teach you what the right thing is. Okay? No, I'm not saying to, you know, spend every night sleeping in, in the bed with each other and, and don't let them have their freedom. Because again, supporting them is also allowing them to spread their wings allowing them to learn how to become independent because really and truly that is the, the goal for a parent. The ultimate goal and responsibility for a parent is when a child becomes an adult, they are able to stand on their own two feet. I mean, again, not saying that they want to just abandon you and then never come back, but saying they want they, can, they are able to stand on their own two feet. That is your job as parent, right? And emotional spoiling will mean that you will have a 25-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old who is still very much dependent. Not necessarily, not saying they want to spend time, because one thing to spend time with a parent when you're older is fine. But when they're dependent on the parent and cannot stand on their own two feet, then that is usually a, re a result of emotional spoiling, right? Or or or, or spoiling of one, one sort or, or another. But a child who turns, you know, is turns 21 and can stand on their on their own two feet but still ask their parents for for help and for advice that that is still an independent individual so that okay. is a healthy child 
the ability to mm-hmm. make decisions on their own and know when to ask for help is necessary. And and know when to ask for help where necessary. Exactly. And and so again, when I say when I say being there for your child and 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 affording them the time, right? This is important because it's like the time to to understand again if they're saying, oh, okay, well, this is what happened at school. And then you say, okay, well, I understand what happened at school and I understand how you may have felt during that, but your response to that was inappropriate, right? Again, that is me still giving time and giving support and giving guidance so that when they're an adult, it's like they understand what they're supposed to do, not just, oh, well, no, yeah, yeah, they shouldn't have done that. And, and always, I guess, picking the side of your child. is like, yes, I'm on my child's side, but not necessarily just for this incident, incident. I'm on my child's side for the my future child, and I need them to learn how to how to cope with these situations, how to how to respond in these situations. And maybe they've done a great job, and you congratulate them for it, or maybe they've done a poor job, and you teach them. But what is this balance between being emotionally supportive and physically supportive of your child versus teaching your child to deal with disappointment? Because life is life, and life is hard, and a lot of people who go through depression, who go through moments of really low self-confidence, et cetera, it's because something disappointing happened and they never learned the coping mechanisms for disappointment. Like I'm terrible with disappointment. I'm better now, but I know mine came up. I know where mine came from. But if you're always there for the child and try to protect the child from pain, the child never really learns to be disappointed so that if you're always dropping your call for the child, you're always running out of meetings. The child never learns to have to deal with it on their own. So in other words, it's like this balance of I'll be there for you most of the time. But I don't know whether promising 100% of the time is setting up the child for failure because a romantic partner can't provide that. A friend can't provide that. A sibling can't provide that. And when they go out into the world and they're like, my dad was always there. Or my mom was always there. It's like, you can't love me. Her love looks like this thing. And this thing that's always there. So yeah, how, where's the balance? Boundary so, setting. So yeah. So so like you. I mean, you touched on it a little bit earlier when with with like if it's a if it's a crisis, if it's a major situation, and I I that is it. It's like look, my being there doesn't mean I I have to physically be there every step of the way. It means right. that if there is a crisis. It's like better believe if there is a major crisis that only I can help with and um, and I'm in a meeting I will leave the meeting because if it is a crisis God forbid my my child got in an accident or something like that I'll, I'll be there right I will physically do everything I can in my power to be there if it is that they're sad because they didn't get full marks in their test better believe I will give them a hug when it's time, but I'm not leaving my work to go and hug them because they didn't get 100% in their test, right? I'm not, so so again, there is a difference between between crisis, emergency, and, and okay, this is, you know, a, a disappointment that if you face in everyday life, and then I will support you, like, when when we have time or when, when you know, their activities are done and my activities are done or whatever, we can come together and we can talk about it and I'll be like, okay, well, the reality is, is that one, you will not be perfect in this life. Things will not happen for you constantly. You, One of the most things that you can, can do for yourself is to learn how to cope with adversity. It is, it is pain tolerance. It is disappointment tolerance. And it doesn't mean to go and, and, and torture yourself. What it means is being aware that the world throws things at you because you're not the only person in it, right? And everybody is striving for something. And sometimes somebody's success means your failure, right? Or your disappointment. And so that means that you can't have it all. And and the, and the, and the, and the rest of the people in the world can't have it all. There's no person in the world that has it all. And if they do, they've been severely limited so therefore they they don't have it all so so the idea is that really getting that in their understanding that i am not going to give you everything the world is not going to give you everything 
Your teachers are not going to give you everything. Your friends are not going to give you everything. It is nobody's duty to give you anything. Nobody's duty. The only duty that, that you have in this world is the duty to, to be able to take care of yourself. And until you become an adult, that is my duty to help you to learn that. Right? Very and good. to help to prepare you for what the reality of the world is, not what we want the world to be. What the reality of the world is. I love, love, love that. What are some clues or cues I can look for to tell if my child is just not doing too well? How would I know, especially if they're mom, they don't want to share? How do I know what to look for? So what I would say is one of the main things is look for changes. Just anything that, that is, well, this is not like my child. So again, if you have a child that normally talks, they're not talking. You have a child that normally likes to go and go outside and play, they're inside all the time. Um, or or a child that is normally all by themselves. Now you this miss might be a, 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 an interesting one because sometimes you might have a child that you're like wondering, wow, what is wrong with this child? Man, this child is so quiet all the time, all the time. And then all of a sudden they're a ball of energy and bouncing off the walls. And you're there like, oh, well, this is what I wanted my child to be like. And so you accept it. But that does not necessarily mean that it's a good thing. Again, and so the idea is noticing changes, noticing what, what you know, maybe they're they're not sleeping as, as well. Maybe it's harder for them to get out of bed, which I know is actually quite normal for teenagers to start going to bed later. But again, noticing these changes, the child is not sleeping well. The child is not eating um, their appetite has changed. Um, their demeanor, their body language has changed. So, their there, attitude. There are a number of those signs. Their attitude has changed. Exactly. They could They're be snapping. irritable or exactly. more rude than usual. Exactly. Exactly. And and the difficulty with teenagers is that sometimes they that is you know they're because they're dealing with that as well is the hormones and the hormones spiking and peaking. And they don't have the same capacity for authority that they used to have, right? And so they might be end up snapping at you, snapping at teachers, snapping at friends. Um, and so their their capacity might be going all, all over the place and everything is going haywire. And they start getting feeling guilty because it's like, oh, man, I was just snapping at my parent. And I don't even know why. It was a small issue. And the parent says, that was a small issue. Why you stop snapping at me? And the reality is that, at that point in time, they snapped because it was a big issue for them. And so that is the thing, like understanding what is going on with them, understanding that as a teenager, they're trying to figure out their identity and where they fit in the world. And so when their when their hormones and all these emotions are 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 kind of spiking and and kind of going all over the place, you know, you find it difficulty as a parent controlling or managing you know your teenager's behavior how do you think it is for them it's going to be really hard for them as well and and so again i, I think really it's a lot of understanding and patience and i think that what when they start to get very i guess a little bit un, unpredictable and again sometimes this is an extreme level and sometimes it's just it's you know the normal mood, mood swings that you can expect but you have to, at that time, really be very, very patient, very, very understanding, not too too forceful, but also really just understanding, you know, where they're coming from and leaving the door open for for opportunities to to bond and connect and and have conversations, and try not to take it personally if they, you know, are pulling away a little bit, but still trying to 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 find interesting new unique ways to to still have that bond with the child that seems to be pulling away a little bit well how do i know when this is now something that i need help with how do i know when it's time to seek the help of a professional or if it's just a normal so, teenage evolution like what's the difference reaching out for help from a professional does not mean and this is again having a, the conversation with the child it does not mean that there's something wrong with you it does not mean that there's something wrong with me. It just means that just like 
how I go to the gym to make sure that my body is functioning at 100%. I, as an adult, and and you as a child, maybe we can also go to a to a psychologist or to a therapist to make sure that we are mentally and emotionally functioning at a hundred percent or as close to a hundred percent as possible. If you if you are concerned, and I guess this is more and more direct answer, if you are concerned and and you feel like things that you have done have not been been helpful, let's approach the subject. And, and and let's get a professional in and see what we can do. Because it might end up being like, like your, your, your child is good. We need to help you to have coping strategies for your child and the child and the changes in the child. Because that's where I wanted to go, right? Um, as we, we come down to a close, that's where I wanted to go. That the reality is we can talk about the issues the children have and how to recognize signs and teach them to cope and get through to them and create emotional safety. But we all operate from the place where we're at. So that if as a parent, you yourself are experiencing stressors and triggers and difficult moments, your capacity is lowered to deal with difficult children. And difficult children don't necessarily mean something that's mentally wrong with them. It could just be, you know, the normal teenage years it could just be the child is acting out for any number of reasons that might not be deep, but we all operate from a position of capacity. As parents, how do we cope with dealing with our children when we have a lowered capacity? Uh, how do we recognize signs of lowered capacity? Like for me, I always tell people, if you're more irritable than usual, take a moment and check in. If you're right. snapping, I think you don't normally snap at or quicker than you usually snap at. Take a moment and check in. You'll, you'll come back and you say, okay, Michelle, why are you being so miserable? Why are you quarreling so much? Why are you so impatient? And more often than not, it's a clue that you're at low emotional capacity and now is not a good time to have certain conversations or to deal with certain situations or people. So as parents, how do you parent when your own capacity Hello. Yeah. So, so as you said, the first thing really is, and and what you said with the with the check in with yourself is like, and that, again, that takes practice. I mean, just telling somebody self awareness. Yourself is like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're you're actually trying to grow your self awareness, and that's the first step, really, because so many times we snap, and then instead of looking at ourselves and say, okay, well, I'm snapping because I'm just, well, it's me. You're like, no, I'm snapping because that person did that. They should have never done that. And so we point the finger. And so when, once you start pointing the finger, it's like there's no room for, for personal growth when we point the finger. So anytime you have a situation that is not the best, it's a perfect opportunity to not say point the finger at yourself and blame yourself. You don't want to blame yourself for everything just willy-nilly. But you look inside and say, okay, well, look, what is going on with me? Could I have done something different? Because... We don't have the power to change that other person or to or, or within with that situation. We have power for ourselves to grow. And if we find ourselves being in, in, in situations that are not pleasant for, for us, it's like, well, is there something that I can do to make that that correction or make that adjustment? Um, and so that's the first thing, really being being self-aware. And having those regular check-ins with yourself, how am I doing mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually? You know, um, am I feeling tired? Am I feeling, you know, have I eaten? You know, that I was at have I been getting sleep? Have I been doing a lot of work? Have I been working late a lot, a lot of days? You know, these things all can give you clues to say, okay, well, look, I'm not ready. And then you come home and the child is screaming and and you know, being a terror because they had a horrible day as well. And you're like, but I can't deal with it. And then you end up shouting and screaming. And, and really and truly, the child might not have done anything wrong, but you're there pointing the finger. It's like, are you behaving like a... And then they say, look, we're going to get you a psychologist because you have a problem. It's, I mean, we've gone wrong in so many, in so many ways, right? And so it's like, okay, well, uh, we look at ourselves and we say, okay, well, uh, I'm struggling with my capacity. Now, if I decide, okay, well, I re recognize I'm struggling with my capacity. Then you start thinking, okay, well, what are different ways I can work on increasing my capacity or 
or you know resting when I need to rest and then you start looking at your schedule and you look at your habits and you look at your hobbies and you look at all of these things and you start to bring things into your life that make that help to recharge those batteries and if you find that again this is not really working it's not really effective again you have your option come see a professional let them help you with with, with ideas that you might not be able to see because it is very difficult to look inward sometimes because sometimes you're so close to something it's hard to see things within yourself so you get a, a fresh set of eyes who can who will might be able to see things clearly and you're like oh wow well, i never even considered it from that perspective say for example and this is something that we commonly see a parent that grew up didn't have much financially and so they're spending all their time work 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 because they want to provide financially for the child the life that they didn't have and all the child wants is their time right and this is a very very common thing the child wants their time the child wants to know that they're just as important as the phone call that just came in they won't want to be feel like they're just as important as the, the the messages that are coming in on their phone just as important as the thing that's going on outside and and all they're saying is not i i gotta work hard i gotta put, pay all these bills and i gotta do this go do it and so they're working they're working they're working and so then their emotional energy that they have left over for the child is little their mental capacity is little their physical capacity is little right and so then it's and then the child wants their time and then they get the time and all they get from the time is a parent that's like this and so then they're like oh well i don't want to spend time with my parent because they're, they're, it's not quality time in closing what advice would you give to parents because i don't want people to think we're saying as a parent you must get everything right and provide everything the child needs and have the right balance and caretake for yourself as well but comparison is just a journey it's a hit and miss you're going to repeat things you learn subconsciously from your own parents, even things you don't like. What advice would you give to parents in trying to balance their responsibility to caretake for themselves, as well as to caretake the mental and emotional well-being of their charges? Yeah, so the, the reality is that nobody's perfect. And you have, you, you have to kind of give yourself a little bit of compassion, understanding that you're not going to be perfect. And if you can give yourself that compassion, passion then you can be a little bit more patient if you feel like you have to be perfect you're going to be always on edge you're going to be anxious and you're going to pass that down to the child as well and so no i say you're going to i don't like to say you're going to but there's a strong possibility that you <laughs> that you might <laughs> um and so again be a little bit compassionate with yourself understand that you're not going to be perfect and it is a process of learning it is a journey you know, the child, however young they are, have only been on this earth for that long and you've only been a parent for that long, right? And so you are learning also the process of what it takes to be a parent and you're constant and you, you evaluate yourself and you say, okay, well, look, I can be better in this area and then you work towards it. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. There were so many points you really hit on, you know, in terms of the balance between emotional safety, protecting your child, but allowing them to experience certain things and knowing that you can be there for them in moments of crisis without feeling like a terrible parent because you weren't there for them all the time. Um, so I am really, really grateful for everything you shared today and um, thank you. And clearly, if you are a parent who is worried about whether or not you are looking out for the emotional and mental well-being of your child, this episode is definitely, definitely for you. Fast forward, rewind, pause, play, watch again. And of course, if you think you need help, feel free to reach out to Russell Mosley. His number will appear here on the screen and he is on our Helping Crisis 246 IG page under the um, helplines number or is it um, local, local therapist number so you can reach out to him if you do believe you need some help. Remember he doesn't only know children and teens, he also does counsel adults so feel free to reach out.